Hello and welcome to the Women Writers Fest, the world's largest traveling festival focused on women writing across genres. Today we have Kalki who's joining us with her book as she debuts from actor to author uh, to talk to us about how she went about writing her journey of pregnancy and motherhood with Elephant in the Womb. Kalki, congrats on your book. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks so much. So what prompted you to write this? Was it was it uh, that motherhood or pregnancy surprised you? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think it started with a little doodle that I did while I was in my third trimester. And I just wanted to remember the kind of things I'd gone through in the, in, in the process of my pregnancy, which I had no idea about. And so I made this funny little doodle poster, which I actually shared on social media about the things, you know, we don't talk about, about pregnancy. So that's where the idea sort of, in, you know, started. Then I left it behind. I, you know, I had to go do this big thing called birthing. And then a couple of months after that, we went straight into lockdown and I found myself having, you know, some time. And that's when I decided to pick up bits and pieces because I had been journaling throughout so yeah that's where it started so you know um the experience of uh, motherhood comes with such a large sack of expectations how is it for you expectations of yourself yeah absolutely i think one of the biggest um, issues that mothers face is guilt you know that we kind of have to do it all i mean firstly are you know there's this whole thing of Oh, everybody does it. It's always it's so natural, and you know uh, your parents have done it over and over again. Your your mothers rather. Um, so so it's seen as something that's just accepted, and of course it has to be because it's the continuation of the species. Um, but that underplaying is what I'm really upset about. I'm like it's actually a really big deal. You're risking your life every time you get pregnant. Um, it's a really big deal, and it, you are putting your life on hold for some time. You know. Um, especially at the very early stages after birth, you really are the primary caregiver. Um, so especially if you choose to breastfeed, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> I found that community isn't really that supportive in today's modern age, you know? I mean, we're supposed to do it just at home with, with our partners. Um, and I, I, I feel like the sense of com community and, and support around is is not so much there. Obviously with COVID, it's even more, sharply um, obvious. Um, so yeah, it was about all of those things for me. And and mother's guilt, um, the fact that everywhere around us, we, we see this subtle sort of advertising of, you know, um, the mother nature and, um, you know, you know, the, the instinct of a mother and things like that. And what if you don't have that? You know, what if it comes less naturally and you have to work at it? So yeah. So what you're saying, what if, would you say was a lived experience? Did it not come naturally to you? Did you struggle with some of this? Some of those, for sure. I, I, I never struggled with love for my child. I think from day one, it's, it's like a mesmerized love for this alien being that has just landed, um, even though you know nothing about, about the, the baby at that point. Um, but there is, uh, and you know, you have, but your instinct, your instinct, what, people call instinct um, is not so beautiful you know it's a raw defensive mechanism so I would wake up in the middle of the night to check my baby's breathing my biggest fear was that I will kill this baby or I, I won't be able to take care of this baby you know so what what is that that's also maternal instinct but we're supposed to see maternal instinct as this very soft gentle uh, kind of thing so I also wanted to talk about the, those those other aspects which is what takes me to the question, when you started sort of probing those aspects, which are not, let's say, par for the course for society to discuss openly, um, motherhood as um, something that can not just be selfless, but selfish. Uh, did you feel that you were being uh, ridiculed for taking uh, a thought process like that? Well, I didn't really share the thought process. Um, I wrote it down. So I didn't. I mean, because I was also in a lockdown, I didn't have that much exposure to a lot of mothers and a lot of people who'd had children. Most of my close friends didn't have children, don't have children. Um, so in my circle, I was kind of the first to do it. Um, 
but actually when i have opened up uh to people i've actually found that they've also opened up about the the difficult things um you know it's just i think that a lot of the time we're afraid to say oh this is so difficult um because most people are just saying how joyous the experience is and then you feel like a real uh, killjoy coming in and be like ah, actually it's a nightmare <laughs> so you know it's just you don't know that so many people are going through it which is why i felt the need to write this book because i know it was it was the people who who told me the really hard parts that actually prepared me for this um very few a handful two three people that i know who are um either single moms or moms who are working a lot and are very busy and they're the ones who said hey this is a big challenge and get ready for it and that that's what prepared me yeah what what kind of things did you talk about in your book uh, you said you know you spoke to a lot of others and then realized that this is something many feel but the aspect of motherhood that's actually publicly talked about is perhaps out of either guilt or fear only a happy one so what were the issues that you came about as you wrote this book around pregnancy and motherhood oh my gosh there's so many so many <laughs> um i'm looking through the book breastfeeding was was one such thing which um you know it was where we're told that breastfeeding is kind of a very natural part of life and and very few people actually tell us actually you know advise us to prepare for it even to get a doula or or a breastfeeding consultant um same thing with uh, sleep for the baby you know very few people advise you to go out and get a a, a sleep um instructor or someone to help you or even to re you know really prepare for that so i just found myself quite taken over by this full time job in the sense that you're waking up every few hours through the night through the day and you are just a cow you know you are just ready for milking every few hours and and for the first few months that's pretty much your job if you are planning on breastfeeding and and this this side of it you know which is so depleting um physically but also emotionally and mentally because it, it's, sleep deprivation is a you know is a form of torture so um this is seen as something that's just meant to happen and then you know you move on uh, you know quickly from that when once you start working again or whatever it is and um and i just felt like hey i think we need to uh you know find ways to support that woman because most women have to do that as well as continue with the domestic realm as well as continue with whatever work commitments they have it was supposed to be these kind of super moms and if there is a if we leave the ha- the choice in the hands of the mother to do what she wants to do whether it's breastfeed or or not or whether she wants to go back to work immediately if we leave that choice in her hands it means that we as a community um whether it's close people who live around um or even structures within the social uh community if if you are ready to pick up the other pieces and right now those pieces are not being picked up so that's one example of of something that i shared yeah <clears throat> so you know um motherhood like many other things um puts women against other women and there's a great deal of judging as to how one is mothering a child how one is raising it how one's going through pregnancy or oh, i never got this or oh, i had you know you've got to learn you got to learn you know all of yeah. that just sort of comes yes, in yes yes um, yes how is those how are those experiences of the people you wrote about and your own Yeah I one of the big experiences that I found common to a lot of the mothers I spoke to is that these WhatsApp mother groups are quite vicious sometimes and can put a lot of pressure you know I, I, one friend was telling me about you know a, a woman who asked whether she could, she should she was thinking of quitting breastfeeding because it was just too difficult and she couldn't manage and everyone just pounced on her about the responsibility and why it's so good and all of this and it was just a question that she was asking and i just feel that pressure is is intense um uh at the same time it's you know it's the same community that can help if you you know if you if you just say actually these are my boundaries this is what i want but in order to do that you need to have choice is also unfortunately so such a privileged thing um you know a certain amount of education uh is necessary for you to know your choices um and that's what i wanted to talk about in this book that some things which 
should be just obvious, should be told to you by your gynecologist or the, the structures around you are just not. Um, and I just you know wanted to share about those. And I never want to take sides. I mean, at no point do I say you should do it this way or you should do it. I hope I don't say that. Um, you know, the choice should be in the mother's hands. It's just how can we make that easier and more open? You know, something you said, the choice should be in a mother's hand, but I'm just wondering, and especially so when we talk of privilege, do you think most often girls uh, who want to be mothers by choice ha don't have that very support, that um, that base of knowledge coming in from their own mums? You know, um, the information gap has been mm. so massive when one gets talking that even our parents, our mothers, Train us, train us to become the sacrificial mother and therefore look at motherhood as a final goal uh, mm. rather than that and therefore don't even prep sometimes, um, you know, our needs for it. Yeah, I think what you talk about the sacrificial mother, I have talked about in, in the book as well. And it is um, something about the previous generation that I myself struggle with my own mother of, you know, where she keeps going on about how much she sacrificed for her children and how her children keep disappointing her because she did this, this, this for them and all of that. And this expectation out of your children also partly comes from not having lived your own life that you invested so much into your children. And then when they are taking their own paths, there's this kind of gaping hole in your identity. So I, it was really important that even though you become a mother, I feel that you search for yourself again and that you find out who you are and what you want to do uh, independent of your child, um, especially as they grow older and they need you less and less. Um, it's a very interesting subject. Um, I only touched on it a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a big uh, it's a big part of life as a mother. <laughs> it is. And sorry, my mother, I just want to say about my mother, when I asked her when I was researching for the book, She's like, I don't remember anything. I've said, I said, you've had three kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I put it all behind me. <laughs> she's like, so she, she's, uh, I think there is this part biology um, that just wipes it out so that you can do it again, you know, because it, if you knew how horrific it was, you probably wouldn't do it again, which is why some of the mothers who told me to, it was a couple of mothers who told me to journal that, uh, that was really helpful because you do forget so many of the details. No, that's so true. Uh, just wanted to ask you, what was the most uh, difficult piece for you emotionally as you um, moved into pregnancy and onwards? Um, there were many different aspects that were difficult. Um, I think my third trimester was, oh my God, it was just like I had enough. I, I felt so... I felt like I'll never get back to my real capacities again. Uh, you know, you and and plus you have this terrible fear that something will go wrong, that you'll lose this baby, that you know the, the kind of nightmares I had. Um, I felt disconnected from my partner, and then I think the other big subject and one of my favorite chapters in the book is um, uh, uh, about sex postpartum. You know how you pick up your sex life after having a child. Um, now, I had a, a, a vaginal birth, so the trauma there is quite uh, significant and it takes a while to heal. Um, but more than just the physical healing, there's a sort of mental and emotional healing that needs to take place, which is, um, you know, getting a sense of time for yourself again. And you can't give time to your partner or to your sex life if you haven't even had time to shower, to take care of yourself, to, to read a book or, you know, do any of those things. And that takes such a long time and a lot of conscious effort to uh, put back into the system and, and support, support from those around you. So, um, yeah, I think that was one of the most difficult, most, most honest chapters that I wrote. <laughs> So one of the things that, of course, um, you know, um, I guess, like I said, people are so quick to judge. Um, having a baby out of wedlock, did you did you get hurt by the kind of commentary that came around it, or, you know? I think I was I was prepared for it. Um, you know, I, I think having already um, been a divorced woman, or you know, you know, just been a woman who's done things slightly differently um, in terms of choice of film career and stuff I, I don't I don't really expect people to to you know 
<clears throat> kind of applaud me every single time I do something wacky. Uh, I don't think it's very wacky, to be honest. So many people are in living relationships. I, I really don't see the big deal. But of course, I've mentioned it as, as well. The attitude, especially towards a woman uh, rather than a man who's unmarried, and has a family is quite different. Um, you know, the questions we get asked are like, "Oh, how will you continue uh, working? Will you uh, will you give up your career?" Uh, you know. Um, whereas for a man, it's like, "Oh, congratulations! Are you a family man? Oh, do you change diapers?" You know, <laughs> like, "Oh, it's so cute." So I think that attitude really needs to change, and the only way for it to change is just to normalize this. <clears throat> Why do you think mothers um, are? often put through this that you know they're kind of treated like mothers um don't have jobs and right. men have to be celebrated for making the balancing act i think it's it's an overall kind of system that's been in place an ancient system of having of patriarchy of having the woman do the invisible work um and so this also is kind of like a reminder to put her in her place to say um you know you know, this is this is what you do. This is you make children and you continue the species and you and the hus the husband or the the man goes out and and earns the money and takes care of the family. Now, of course, things have changed. The modern age, um, women are working, women are independent, but there is still sort of a, a structure in society which says this subtly. Like I spoke spoke about how in my third trimester, um, even though I'm you know very privileged to have um, a set of people to dress me up for events, for glamorous events. We couldn't find high or low any designers who did uh, glamorous pregnancy clothing. So we were, you know, fixing things with a tailor, putting a rubber band around, elastic around the button, um, putting a belt over a large size dress, et cetera, et cetera. So it made me think, you know, you know, we don't have a problem with, with the fashion industry has no problem making small baby clothes, which we, you know, quickly grow out of. I mean, the baby wears it maybe once or twice and then it grows out and it's expensive. But we don't have that for the third trimester pregnant woman. And is that because, you know, we wonder if she's all uppity and uh, fashionable during a pregnancy, who's going to take care of our children uh, while she goes back out to work or whatever it is. So I know these are the kind of questions that I ask, and I, I just feel we should be asking as a society. We seem on the on the on the layer of it to be a modern society, but a lot of those structures underneath are still very patriarchal. A lot, a lot of them. Uh, Kalki, can you just show your book? I always say this on the Women Writers Fest that please go out there, not just listen to our conversations, but. Um, Take a look at this book, go pick it up on the shelves. Um, the idea is for all of you to add more women writing and read a variety of what we are saying uh, by putting it on the bookshelf and paying for it. Uh, cool. I love it. Yeah. It's got so many editions. Um, and it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's fun and easy to read. It's really, um, I mean, we're, we're trying to uh, make it also not a complete traumatic experience for you. <laughs> so enjoy it. <laughs>